Hey, bonsoir, Don't even see you. good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You have just seen 12 Hour Shift. Welcome to the live Q&A for said great film. It is a pleasure to introduce to you writer, director, Bria Grant. From the cast, we have Nikea, Gabby Turner, Chloe Farnsworth, David Arquette. And then on the producer end, this is interesting, they're in one square, but we have HCT Media here. Uh, and that is that consists of composer and cinematographer Matt Glass, producer and actor Tara Perry, and producer Jordan Long. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey. <laughs> so where to begin? First, I guess it's worth mentioning just for the viewers that uh, Bria, you just came off set. You're in Bulgaria, and you just got back to your hotel. It's what time? It's six fourteen in the morning. Right there, you go. <laughs> Yeah. So everyone bear that in mind. I, I feel yeah, like that's probably an important context. <laughs> yeah, keep it easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I love this film so much. Uh, and I guess the, the natural place to begin with is it's Genesis. Uh, what made you feel compelled to tell this story? I mean, I think it was a combination of a lot of things. Um, I grew up in East Texas and um, I love small town politics and small town people. I think it's cool. there's a lot of fun characters to pull from there. Obviously there's a lot of them in this movie. Um, and I grew up in the nineties and I think this movie is sort of an ode to the nineties um, as Y2K, but also um, all the sort of urban legend stuff. I wanted to play as like an, an undertone um, specifically the, the urban legend about the um, waking up in your bathtub with the your yeah, kidneys see. missing. And this is sort of my my interpretation of what might have happened to those kidneys. Mm. But then there's there's a unique aspect of tragedy by setting it right at the onset of the US opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, it's something at that time we never could have known, but I think if you were living in the South or living in some of these small towns, you might've been affected by that in some way and never mm -hmm. could have foreseen where that could have gone. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's an important backdrop to the, to the film as well. I mean, I think the nineties is an era we think of as, um, you know, there's, there's other things I think people often point to from the nineties when they're doing movies like this. And I don't think we, we talk about that specifically mm -hmm. at all. I don't and touched on very much at all. And yet when you think about artists, when you think about specifically in film and music and literature, the 90s was a lot of heroin, a lot of opiates. Yeah, for sure. I mean, grunge, how, how else would you have made exactly. grunge? Exactly, the that? industrial music scene and a lot of the <laughs> underground film scene looks so much so more so than now in a lot of ways, I would yeah. say, from what I see. Um, yeah. But uh, Angela's character, I feel like that's, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate she can't be here with us. Um, but, but she's so much the emotional core of the film. Uh, do you want to talk a bit about bringing her onto the film and what she brought to it? Yeah, well, um, pretty early on, um, I was at, I think I was in the room that they're at, that Dritera, Jordan, and Matt are in right now. <laughs> yeah, I think I was in the living room um, of, uh, of Tara and Jordan's house and, um, and we were trying to figure out who we might want to bring in for this leading role. And um, we'd all been big fans of Angela's for a long time. So um, when we when I brought her up, I they were 100% on board from the very beginning of, of calling her. And then it was a bit of a process getting the script to her. Um, the, the role was originally written um, a little bit younger so that um, Chloe's character and Angela's character would have been closer to the same age. Um, oh, I see, yeah, and, okay, I see that. Yeah, and so, um, uh, when we sent it over to Angela's agents, they didn't send it to her. <laughs> they were like, this is not right for her. She won't want to do it. As um, agents are want to do, yeah. 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 That's another so, role, basically, yeah. is not actually conveying the messages they're supposed to convey. Right, I, that's, <laughs> well, listen, I, um, so I decided to go around them and I called one of my friends who knew her and I was like, can I, can you send um, Angela Bettis this script and let her know we're interested in her and they did and she liked it. And then Tara and I met up with her and she was, um, she had a few questions, but she was really gung ho about it. Fantastic. And this whole ensemble you put together is so strong. What's, what's amazing with the film is the way the characters are written, you have this, this strange clashing of tones between you know, a, a more realist, hard-edged drama, like a really, you know, an informed place of drama, and then something more kooky and even borderline kitsch, but yet there's still an aspect of real honesty behind that and a consistent thread of, of kind of hurt uh, and, and anger. And it, it's, 
it's beautiful. And, and I wonder how much of this was written specifically uh, for Nikea, for David, for Chloe, uh, or the piles of happy accidents that came in after you'd written. Piles of happy accidents. I think, I think like, I have to give credit like to Angela because I do think she really grounds the film in a nice way so everyone else could kind of be kooky and crazy and kind of do whatever they wanted. Yeah, and but she no. keeps a thorough severity. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she, because she plays it very real, everyone else can come in and kind of do whatever they wanted um, and everything's kind of played in the same universe then. And no, we actually, I mean, I think Chloe and Nakia could talk to the, could speak to this and Tara, because um, Tara's obviously in the movie as well. Um, uh, but we, they actually both auditioned for, for it. I, I didn't know them beforehand. And it just happened that I ended up with the two, three, three of the best actresses in all of Los Angeles in the movie. Mm. <laughs> you guys all want to talk about your experience? Maybe starting with Nikea? Oh, do you um, want to talk about your experience making the film? Oh yeah, and it's Nakia, by the way. Oh, I am so sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <Nikia>. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well, um, so this actually was a very, not a unique, well, I, I love horror and I hate it at the same time. Uh, <laughs> I'm scared of it. I'm always like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure. I hate jumping. <laughs> <laughs> but now that I've done this, it, it put it in a, it put horror in a different light for me as well. And then um, also Bria's writing is very um, fun and easy. And like, I remember getting the script and I read it in like, and that, like not even, it didn't even take me like 20 minutes to, I mean, I was literally like, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? What's gonna happen next? What's gonna happen next? And then I was like, I really have, I really want this. <laughs> I really want this movie. And it happens to be my first like lead in the film too. So I'm very grateful for that as well. Um, uh, so it, the ex but the experience was genius. I mean, they are a small and mighty crew. Uh, we had a great time on set. Um, I, I, I think I've, you know, fell in love with everybody because it was such a, it was such a warm place to be. And also, um, like, it's not hard to be funny when you have funny writing already. Yeah. And then you just kind of go off of that. You just kind of, you know, and she wasn't funny, funny in the film. Yeah. So I think that I, I'm an, I'm a, you know, a, I would say I'm a comedic actress. I, you know, I do a lot of comedy stuff. I, mm. I've done sketch comedy. Um, I'm, you know, I do improv. So she did allow us to have a lot of fun after a while. Well, allow us to do our own take after a while. That's like, a you know, I, I already kind of knew that my character wasn't going to be the serious, <clears throat> you know, hey, don't you do that character. Mine is like- But you're not that light like, either. I feel mine like. is the uh, bitch don't get me in trouble, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So. <laughs> Did you model any of this from, from your, your observations of, of nurses, of just healthcare professionals? Well, I know my sister- there's an authenticity to your role. My sister is a nurse. I oh, well, there you are, of, okay. I play a lot of nurses. <laughs> <laughs> a lot it's of all nurses. second nature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and then just, I just, and I also am a student of this too. So I, I try to always know what, to do when I come on set. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I just, you know, I'm 911, uh, the show 911, I delivered a baby and I was like a champ at it. I was like, I know what I'm doing. You just kind of have to go in there and be like, I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it literally was that thing. And you know, it was, to be the first and in, in, in really actually get to say words, lots of words on screen uh, <laughs> was also amazing. But um, to be able to just kind of feel and be in, with everybody and, and Chloe, first of all, Chloe and Angie were probably uh, like the, and, and Angela, were like the best people to work with. <laughs> gave me so much, gave me so much to like work with and deal with so that it could be grounded and authentic too. Mm -hmm. So it was amazing. Cool. Aww. I see David, you have a look like, what am I chopped liver? <laughs> no, not at all, not at all, please. <laughs> Please continue with these incredible ladies that put this film together. <laughs> Absolutely. That was Chloe, what were yeah. your experiences working um, with Bray on this film? Well, Bria's script is just, it's fantastic. Um, it's, it's incredible, like the writing, everything about it just kind of pulled me in. Um, and I think I, I always get this mixed up. I think I wrote to Matt 
to audition for the film or was it Jordan, Matt? Yeah, both I think of we us. All, I think we all both of yeah. all of Because <laughs> yeah. I, saw, I saw the audition and I wrote to them because I, I saw the character outline and I was like, I have to, I have to go in for this because it's so kooky and I had all these ideas to do for this character. Um, so yeah, I was really happy when I could audition for it. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just fantastic. And Angela and like everybody was amazing to work with. Um, yeah. And it was just such a good time. I mean, I had a ball. Absolutely loved it every minute. <laughs> <laughs> cool, David. Oh, I love I loved working with everyone. I've, I've known Matt and Jordan for so long, and Tara. So it was just wonderful, and they brought Bria's script, and and it just I don't know. We we we'd been working together quite a bit, and um, I love the script and. Bria had such a strong vision for it. It was just, it was a very fun set. It was also Christina, who's not on the the, the call, but she uh, she did such a great job. It was her first scripted film that she produced. So to see her do That's her really magic, cool. she I was I was I was always saying like you're the greatest <laughs> producer I've ever worked with because she <laughs> really is. Her skill set uh, for being a reporter just fit right into like. Perfect. She was doing people's W two forms, and it was just really fun to watch. That's she's, awesome. She was. Oh, sorry. What? Oh, she's amazing. She is amazing. She was also a producer on You Can't Kill David Arquette, right? Yeah, she sure was. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so where to go? There was a few things that I wanted to bring up. Okay, yeah, one thing that's got to get mentioned. Um, as, as you go from room to room and you have these peripheral characters that come in and often they're just there for like one or two scenes. What's interesting is that every single one of them, even if they're silly, they're textured just enough and they're charismatic just enough and performed in enough of a living, vibrant way that they could actually be their own protagonist in a different film that you could actually. <laughs> and what's funny is, I mean, as I feel like I know that it was it was a low budget shoot and it had to be done resourcefully and time was not on your side in a lot of cases. And I feel like only a director who's also a writer and also an actor would take the extra time to make all of that happen. Uh, do you want to speak to that a bit? Yeah, I mean, we just had a really good cast on our hands. It was a lot of a lot of the cast, um, you know, Kit Williamson, Brooke Sagan, all of those people, um, Tom DeTrenis, they're all writers. Almost oh, every wow. I don't know if there's actually very many of our cast members who are not also writers or directors or producers in some fashion, which made it nice on set because then if there was like something that needed to be done, they'd be like, oh, I'll go pick up the pizza. Yeah, or, you know, you know they like, were always going to like help out. Um, but I think that really helped. But also we talked about that quite a bit. Like if, I mean, Tom DeTrenis plays this character, you know, keeps finding the organs throughout and, um, uh, we we kept saying like what is this guy's story like what was what is he doing the rest of the movie and like that was always really funny to us and I think because <laughs> it got funny we kind of built on it throughout and um, I will give a shout out to to the um, producing team because I mean Scott we shot this on location in Arkansas it's hard to get that number of actors in there and like I, I mean it's a scheduling nightmare because there's actually be. quite a few people in this movie for a low budget film yeah. It, it's a huge group, yeah. And you were able to get that hospital location. Like you had a whole floor of a hospital, didn't you, for a sustained amount of time? Yeah, yeah. That's Tara, an only in our Kansas thing, I would, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Tara should talk about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, uh, Jordan and I went. Uh, to, we're from Arkansas, uh, and so we went. We were home for Christmas, I guess, mm -hmm. and we went to the hospital um, to because my dad found out there. He was like, "Why don't you go ask this this." this one because it's available and um jordan's really good at talking to people and went in there and they just could not be more excited to like open arms welcome us to this hospital it was like anything you need we will stay out of your way and we're like you're a working hospital like we'll stay out of your way uh, but they were incredible anytime we needed anything like even if it was something physical that the character was needing to tie you know something on someone's arm Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I'm doing it right. A nurse would come up and like give us a lesson on the spot or like make sure this bag is held upside down. Or, That's you know, wild. Like that. And there's yeah, the authenticity sure. of like the actual late 90s medical gear being accurate. Yeah, we, we yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> That's pretty uncommon. That, yeah. was, that was the <laughs> one level of the hospital that had not been redone. And I went to a um, recycling plant for mm -hmm. all, I, 
any type of computer, fax machine, telephone, anything that is beige, I need it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, one funny observation is, you know, the way bleach keeps being used in the film. At the time that, that it was made, I presume none of you could have imagined that it would be completed and publicly shown in a period where a major political leader would suggest the ingestion of bleach for its medical benefits. <laughs> Is anything to say about that? Well, the, the I mean, <laughs> I can't <laughs> really, I don't think the future. Um, <laughs> I, the, the the origins of the bleach story is actually there was a nurse from Texas who Killed was killing patient. people uh, with yeah. bleach uh, in their dialysis machines, and so that had always been in my head, and so it sort of made its way into the script. Um, but uh, no, he's an idiot. I don't. I mean, what what is there to say? <laughs> no. um, it's just, November. It's a weirdly prophetic in its own strange would, way. Would you like to get um, married? I need to come to Canada. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I well, said, I'd like to get married. You. I need to come to Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you marry, please, uh, or any of your cohorts, or anybody in Canada, <laughs> marry you because this is me. It's another four years. I'm out. So. You know, just like we can go. Like, how do I love to have you as a Canadian? That would be beautiful. Like, what do I have to do? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a lot of U.S. friends who are hoping to move to Canada or basically anywhere but where they currently are, depending <laughs> on the results of the next election. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I wonder as well when you when you did get that hospital location. There's something about the way the film is written. I mean, in general, we see a lot of films that take place in the medical world, and they're usually focusing on doctors. And of course, I mean, if you have if you've ever had experiences with either friends or family who work or are relying on healthcare. You know, I mean, it becomes its own subculture. And regardless of the city or country that's taking place in, there it really is its own special community with the, their, their own jargon and sense of gallows humor. And specifically, the doctors might be important, but the nurses are the most interesting in that they're the ones dealing with the most amount of people in these periods of incredible time-sensitive, you know, grief and panic. They're the umbilical between the doctors, the patients, and uh, the family of the patient. Uh, did did the, the hospital that you approached, were they taken by that? Was that a motivating factor in them giving you free run of an entire floor? Or no? Oh, they, <laughs> it didn't we, matter. They didn't, they were like, yeah, just shoot here. Just whatever. No, yeah. no we, we, what? sat down, <laughs> we sat down with all the executives at the hospital and kind of had to explain what the film was and, uh -huh. and kind of like our take on, on Bria's script and how we were going to shoot that and what we needed. And they were just extremely giving to us and, and offered up the third floor. They actually gave us all of the blueprints uh, from the build out. And so in this house that we're in, like Bria came over and we just kind of lined it out and we're like, okay, these are the rooms we have. Let's shoot on this end. Let's put actors over here. Let's put our production studio over here. Let's feed people here. And, and then kind of went back to the hospital administrators and they we were like, this is kind of what we're doing. And they were like, well, you're going to need chairs here and you're going to need this. Let's go to storage. And it was really yeah, great too, because they said, finally, can we tell you how to do things right that they always get wrong on TV shows? Mm -hmm. We were like, yes, please. So, yeah. yeah. And at one point I did, I, 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 we were shooting and um, there, there was a nurse up there and I remember, and I remember asking, cause I was like, are, are these nurses too bitter? Are they too like angry? And she was like, oh no, no, no. <laughs> they're, not, <laughs> they're not over it enough. Like they can, you can push it more. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Okay, let's open up some questions from the audience. So yeah, to you, the audience, this is so weird. Uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, or at least there should be if technology has not completely failed us tonight. And through that magicking, you can write messages and we will see them. Ah, they're coming in. Okay, so for Nakia, yours is my, this is from a man named Sachin. For Nakia, yours is my favorite performance in a movie full of great ones. Was any of your dialogue improvised? It comes off very naturally, especially the way you and Angel, Angel, um, Angela, sorry, play off each other. Uh, I'm sorry, I was, I, I stopped listening after he said it was my favorite. Killed <laughs> <laughs> it. Killed Thank it. You so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh my God. Say that Ooh, one more time. I'm, I'm a little teary. Oh, I'm a little sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. What now? Okay. So uh, you were my favorite performance in a movie full of great ones. Indeed. Was any of your dialogue improvised? It comes out very naturally, especially the way you and Angela play off each other. 
Um, I think um, gratefully and graciously, Angela and I really, well, we went to, we went to dinner as soon as we all arrived. And we all, uh, Chloe, uh, my, Chloe, myself and Bria, um, because we were all just meeting and we hit it off um, immediately. So that made it that much greater. And Angela is such a wonderful, beautiful human being. And she, again, she's so giving in her scenes and, and who she is as, a, as an actor. So it was amazing to, to just work off of her. And she gave me every, I tried, you know, and I, and I watched her. I tried to match, you know, like match her energy sometimes, but also, you know, know that I have a specific role to play too. Um, and um, and to, we, did, we did get improvs, but I don't, rem it, it all kind of runs together. So I don't really remember actually what was improv and what was not, but um, it was just, it just, it just came. And I think it was just funny. It was, it was, it was because it was funny to me. It was just fun and funny. But again, like Chloe and Angela are some of the best actors I got to work with. So it, it, I think it was just easy to be the character. Karen is a very uh, crazy, interesting, very long lived. She's been doing this forever and she really just doesn't give a fart. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and she is in charge of this thing. Right. So you know, there's not very many hiccups and she doesn't do hiccups well, you know what I mean? So I think that's why it really resonated with me because I'm also that person kind of, I'm a, you know, I'm, an, I'm a very alpha lady and I like things to be in order and right and like, <laughs> so I think, you know, I, I relate to Karen in that way. And so I think it just came because, you know, and the words, the words were already there. And, you know, and I, like I said, I love, I love being an actor. So I just wanted to make this one of the best things that it could be. And thank you for saying that to me. It makes me feel so good. That's sweet. <laughs> so Camille would like to know, what did you use for the kidneys? Uh, those were just a prop. Um, Tara Jordan, they were a prop that yep. Gypsy yep. Taylor brought in. Um, just, they're, they're just like kidney, like organs you buy at a prop store kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They're just, just made them real bloody. Good old fashioned. Foam latex, Foam, latex and soaked, rubber. Soaked in yeah. blood. Yeah. They were not like, we didn't like go buy like a pig heart or something like that and throw it in there. <laughs> There's like, no good story. Well, better them. not to have, for sure. <laughs> the hot lights and closed spaces. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Antonio Quintero is asking, love the film. This is coming from a fan of films that <laughs> place in one night. I noticed you have two wrestlers in the film. How did you get Mick Foley and David Arquette? Well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I'm a huge fan of Mick Foley, and we reached out to him, and he did it. It was sort of magical. Yeah. I really and love him. Literally. He's, like he's, an absolute, he's an absolute sweetheart. He's the nicest guy. And David and Mick, uh, the hospital actually has a floor that's working on it. And um, there were some patients that knew that they were there, and uh, they were so kind. I mean, Mick was there for one day, and on that one day, David and Mick went and visited, um, you know, these long in long term patients. And uh, yeah, it's really incredible. They're just yeah, they're good people. And 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 David was on as a as a producer, and um, like to his credit, would come and like bring snacks to the set, and like just bring <laughs> good energy. And one day, he brought a donkey. He brought a donkey to set. <laughs> that was, that was, I have to say, that was Christina's idea for sure. But yes, like, today he needs did a bring donkey? a donkey to set. I missed yeah. the donkey. You were, hey, you more, more is needed. No. <laughs> we can't go down this conversational trail and end at that. So, yeah, what, there was this, that in? what did you do with it? There was this donkey that was a, a guy that does this charity called Diego Farms, where they bring uh, horses to different kids charities and um they had a donkey that was so close to them that it had come into their house and it kind of lived with them it's just very custom to people so he's like let's bring it uh, christina thought it'd be fun to bring it to the set i think it was for your birthday or for some some celebratory I day i don't know yeah oh yeah it was just for a donkey yeah that was the, the most episode. important point is to the set i.e a working hospital I oh, know. no, no this actually was it's no small part of the insanity of that <laughs> We should clarify. We should clarify. Not 
bring a donkey yeah, to a hospital? Yeah. No, we <laughs> took it to the auto place. It was just an auto. Oh, okay. You have to go up and oh, I was like, oh my God. I can just imagine the front desk just being like, take it to the third floor. <laughs> okay. We did have, um, because when you shoot in a, in a smaller town, it, like word gets around. And I think there was a bit of people showing up and they're like, oh, on the third floor. And they would just roll in there and be like, heard you're shooting a movie. And like, and then Jordan would put them in it. Jordan oh, would put cool. them in the background. <laughs> <laughs> like you have four hours. If he had shown up, he would have been in the background at the hospital. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So next question from Jay Cutter. Were there any improvisations so fun on set that you had to use it in the movie? Oh yeah. Yeah. So um, something I learned from Kit Williamson who actually plays the officer in the movie. Um, I work on his show called Eastsiders, mm -hmm. um, which is on Netflix. And I worked on it for, I, I was a producer on it for three years. And then I was a writer and director on the last season. Um, he always gives actors um, an improv take, something they can do. Like if you if you run the scene and you have, because we have a lot of really long scenes in this movie. And then at the end we go, I'm like, okay, you do whatever you want. You've done what I want. And we, I mean, what's really nice is we had, we actually took the time to do that. You a lot of times don't have time on this size budget. And, mm -hmm. and we did it every time and our, our, when, when we could do it. And I used so much of that improv. I mean, I, I can't tell you, we had such, funny people in the movie. So there were things they would say and I was like, great, like use that. You make me look like a genius. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I mean, I, I love it when people can play with it. And for me, it means the actors have really taken control of the characters and they've- exactly. they, It's such a great way for them to find their character when they can do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, once we've cast someone, I want them to be in charge of that character. That's why they have that character, you know? And I want them to, do what they think that character would do. And so it really helps me too, to see where they're at. Um, but yeah, I used, I mean, I, I can't say the percentage, but I'd say like 20%, 10, 10 20% is like improv stuff. That's amazing. It's, it's quite I haven't even put some bonus features on the eventual Blu-ray of just, you know, unused stuff that you loved that were just variant takes. Cause there must <laughs> be like just reams and reams of great material. It would be so long. Chloe had a running joke with Mick Foley that did not make it into the movie that they were very sad about. <laughs> he DMs me about it still. He still sends me messages about that. They had a joke. I don't, it was like, there's some sort of like fart in a fan factory joke or something. That was the, that was the joke. A fan in a fart factory. A fan, yeah. yeah, they couldn't figure it out. A fan in a fart factory, but they were saying it wrong. And so then they were going back and forth. And I was like, this is not making it into the movie, but you can keep going. <laughs> Cool. But before I go to more questions from the audience, uh, Matt, sorry, we haven't engaged you yet. The visual approach for the film, which is really, really inspired of that. I mean, it's gorgeously shot and beautifully used of location. But then there's also this interesting thing you have going where when you get into different characters' rooms, the way you cover it changes in fundamental ways. In some cases, it's all wides. In some cases, almost all mediums and close-ups. Um, there are really specific choices per room, as if each room becomes its own little ecosystem in the hospital. Do you want to talk to that a bit? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, Bria was really, she did so much, uh, so many overheads for all the scenes. So we would go through every overhead for every scene where the characters were standing and we talk about characters and what their motivation was and that kind of stuff. And yeah, we tried to like make every room feel different. But we also, the thing that was tricky was we couldn't use a lot of lighting equipment in there because of the long takes and stuff like that. So a lot of, I mean, in rooms we could. So that was the place where we tried to put most of the attention to like you know, making the characters speak through the rooms, but it was interesting to try to avoid what usually happens in horror hospital movies where it's like super dramatic lighting where, you know, you make it look like a horror movie and instead we made it look like a tired hospital, you know what I mean? So that it was, it was about the characters and it was about their journeys. And then, yeah, and then the rooms were like the icing on the cake where we actually went through and like got to bring out a little bit of character in there, which was fun. And then like the uh, body shop was a really fun one too, because we just mm -hmm. loaded it, it up with yeah. weird lights. Our stuff. homemade, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bria, Bria was great. We went through every single scene. Bria already had all these great mapped out overheads. And we're just like, she's like, is this possible? I'm like, yeah, I think we can do this. What about that? And it was, yeah, it was a fun collaboration. And it was helpful because I think when going in, we were like, okay, this room always feels like this. Like we kind of had an idea going into it. Yeah, um, yeah. Which made it made it much. You could tell which room it was without even like really seeing what was in there because they all looked the same. 
you could tell right. just from the feeling, which is fun. That's cool. Um, so here's one. Was the cake that bad? <laughs> no, it was really bad. It was really bad. <laughs> it was no, never. It was, I like I grocery store cake. I like grocery. It <laughs> sat out for like the whole shoot, though. It did, and people kept still eating. I ate it. I well, ate on it. It wasn't the cake per se. It was the the blue. I don't know. Blue icing never tastes, especially on a sheet cake, never tastes delicious. <laughs> and I think I had that that piece right then, and I I didn't mean to actually make that face. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> hey, authenticity. It did catch me. I was like, oh, oh, oh. Oh, wait. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's just my natural enjoying cake face. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, Kagaline Roy asks Can you talk a little bit about the artistic choice of going for a strong soundtrack like this? It's almost a character on its own. Yeah, Matt did the soundtrack as well. He did the score. He is the he's the DP and the composer. And, composer. Yeah, I love and, it. Picture, and he did VFX. So <laughs> you have more VFX questions Fantastic. also goes to us. Um, Matt, you should talk about that. Sure. Uh, yeah, I know from when we started off, me and Bria were throwing songs back and forth to each other. She had a lot of ideas about using drums, like drum heavy and or just drums, like as I'm trying to think of a good example. We talked about Birdman, but less jazzy, I think was the is the comment. And then we both loved the soundtrack to Us, which used choir in such a strange way that that became a jumping off point to where it was like um, Chloe's character was so inside of her head that she saw everything she did as like this grand opera. So it became this thing where her elements were opera based and uh, Angela's character was more drums based. And as their characters got together, that started to mix. And then all these different layers started to come in. And by the end of it, it's the music is almost like a cartoon in that it's uh, matching the action. So if like a character is falling, the music falls and it became like, yeah, like a character of its own. It was such a fun, strange mixture of elements that shouldn't work together, but I think they ended up playing pretty well together. And they running their own theme. Yeah, it was so very cool. unique. And, <laughs> That's so cool. And it's coming out on vinyl in the next Ooh, season. Nice. So that will be very exciting. Yeah, uh, That's fantastic. Which label's putting it out? Can we say, have we signed anything? Uh, we I don't know if we can yeah. yet. Okay, Mitch, Mitch, you can guess. I bet you can guess. There's <laughs> something I can think of. Yeah, I just of vinyl, there's two. So. <laughs> <laughs> does a lot of cool vinyl for our movies. <laughs> okay. Um, so one last question then uh, to close the night on. What is your most cherished memory from the production, each of you, or the most unusual? That time David Arquette brought a donkey to set. That's, <laughs> <Yeah. what we're laughs> yeah, that's gonna be everyone's answer. Shoot. Um, second most memorable experience on the production. Um, let's see. For me, it's the fi was one of the final shots. I have this like BTS photograph of Angela, like bloody and holding on to Matt, who's who's filming. Um, and uh, it's as the sun's coming up, and it's it's when Angela and Chloe are uh talking after the vending machine and um for me that was that was huge i think mm -hmm. because it was such a indie film and it was uh pretty tough and we all did a hell of a job mm -hmm. and uh we rocked it so for me that moment seeing angela kind of leaned against matt was a big moment for me that's fine yeah because we it's also you know a 12 hour shift that starts at night and goes all morning we didn't do one night shoot it was all during the day <laughs> which right. was um in a way so getting that shot yeah it was magical because we needed it to be stormy and it's arkansas so you never know uh and it happened to be crazy stormy that night and it was yeah. really gorgeous that was actually a really nice way to have the finale all come together mm -hmm. yeah Fun. it was a lovely moment yeah <laughs> cool others um i i think the last i i agree with you guys i think like the last moment where we kind of you know, finishing up and the walk away and the last few, I know, yeah, the last few scenes. And it was like, I think it was hey, like six or seven in the morning when we shot. Sorry, I'm just finishing the scene. It's almost over. Oh, yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> but yeah. That and singing and the, the, the oh, musical yeah. number, that was really yeah. well, We, we didn't even discuss the musical thing. number, right. Fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry, do you, want, do you want to go into a moment of what brought that in? I mean, did you plan that at the time? I mean, obviously it's very, very specifically shot, but at the time that the production began, I get a sense that that could have only happened midway through and you had more of a sense of how the groove was flowing. And I mean, how did, what gave you the confidence to do that? It works, by the way, of course, but. 
I love a musical number. So I was very Easy. happy to have multiple musical numbers. Um, um, uh, yeah, I guess halfway through. Well, so what's so weird about that scene, um, not the musical number scene, but there's a scene where Tommy's dancing down the hallway. Um, uh, the EMT, Tommy is dancing down the hallway. Um, mm -hmm. That is actually shot on three different days and we had to find a way to cut that together because we only had David on a certain day and we lost Tommy on a certain day. So it was this weird thing where like, we actually used music on that to kind of work through that moment. But the musical number was, we, we talked about it early on, I think, because we had the, found the chapel and then I like started looking up public domain songs with the word blood in them. And then that came up and then we kept going through it. And then I can't remember what finally, we were just like, let's, this is going to be the thing we're going to do. I and then- was it Tom? It was Tara and Tommy can sing so well. I mean, yeah. I think that really gave you some inspiration there to be like, oh man, we have we have these two people. Why don't we use them? Yeah, I think and, like yeah. you said, when when some of the most of the actors who are also writers, directors, whatever, it's just like, what else do we have that we can do right now? <laughs> like what other kind yeah. of thing can we throw in this pizza? Mm -hmm. Tara and Tommy are both on uh, we're both on a um, on a show in which they sang and danced together. So I knew that about them too. <laughs> and Matt, I, yeah. I thought it was really cool. Yeah, go ahead. I just didn't think it was ever going to happen. I'm like, yeah, fine, we'll do a musical thing. <laughs> and then I was like, even if we'll see it in post and it's not going to work. And it's so well, it's like, it shouldn't work. It's, it's yeah. done in such an assured way that it really does play. Yeah. But yeah, usually that type of thing would throw me out of the film so quickly. And so like, it would be just the heightens the absurdity of it, but still has an intensity underneath it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they, so it's them singing live on camera and there was no um, music behind them. So I, when I did the music backing track, I had to like match their tempos and Tommy's tempo is different from Tara's tempo. So it was this whole thing of like, just, it was such an organic process. And like the beats aren't, like I said, they're not too uh, a metronome. So there's something <laughs> a little odd and driving about what happens when Tommy starts to sing that I think really like brings it all together. And you're like, oh, this works great. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they're both such good Matt. They're such good singers. And then Matt, yeah, did an amazing job. And we I knew we needed a song there. And I had reached out to a couple 90s bands trying to get some songs. Like I was like, I reached out to like the Beastie Boy. I like like went a little crazy with it. And, and they're I cinephiles. Like, I would have thought they actually would have gone for it if that was the case. No, they did not want to. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, was it a manager thing that, again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that and that idea came up and um I don't, I did not know Matt didn't believe we weren't going to do it. Cause I felt like from the very beginning, Jordan was like, yeah, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's do it. And I was like, oh, cool, cool, cool. That's how our relationship works now. One of us is always just driving. <laughs> <laughs> it. Excellent. Um, so yeah, any, any other great memories? Oh, 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 I do. Please, okay. Yeah. So um, I think my favorite, okay, kind of two. My favorite, my most favorite is driving to the airport with Jordan's mom, Tammy. Aww. Um, we had, it was, it's about a 30 minute ride. We had the best conversation ever. Um, and she's just the greatest. And we still like, you don't know this story, but we still talk on our own. Hey. And, uh, <laughs> I love it. Tammy time. Tammy time. Tammy time. <laughs> My second favorite was when, um, for what I think we all, it, it was a, I think I was about to rap, but Tommy was rapping. And we all went out one evening and had a ball at this bowling alley. Laser and tag. Everybody, and Laser oh, so fun. Yeah. But it was like so organic, so fun. And I, you know, I, it was just, I mean, the whole experience, I mean, you hear people talk about terrible experiences on set. This was not, and, and everybody keeps talking about the magic that this was. It was magical. It, it, was, mm -hmm. it was a beautiful, beautiful experience that I'm glad everybody gets to see yeah beautiful yeah all right well thank you very very much everyone uh did anyone else have anything want to throw in i mean this i don't want to rudely cut no no because i realized i didn't do the whole circle but what <laughs> sorry okay i thought i saw oh, a oh i think david has a movie he needs to plug well no, I'm that's that, but you can <laughs> absolutely do it yourself please no well matt was actually did the mu music in you cannot kill david arquette too I and HCT Media, everybody who helped with the, uh, you know, working on the finishing of it. But I was yeah. just so honored to do this movie and to, for us to do a, a scripted film uh, 
Jordan, Matt, and Tara, we've known each other a long time. And then Christina, to see her do her first, produce her first feature was really exciting for me. That was my favorite part. And plus, Christina's like a hypochondriac and she's in this <laughs> hospital worried about germs all the time. <laughs> that was pretty she had a Clorox cool. bleach. Why? Yeah. yeah. A, she was doing that I before <laughs> anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And yeah, to that end, so to be honest, I should mention David's film on Monday night, You Cannot Kill David Arquette, will be having his international premiere. Uh, David will be there with the two directors for a live Q&A. And Bria, tomorrow night, we're having the international premiere for a film that she stars in and scripted, Lucky, directed by Natasha <laughs> Kermani. Yeah. Uh, definitely don't miss that. And again, that will be followed by a live Q&A. And Tara, um, and Tara is also in Lucky. Tara is also in, I'm in so Lucky. I'm so sorry. Even, oh my God, that's crazy. Oh, where's, where's I thought I saw it in February, but I spent <laughs> yeah. Sorry, and so is Nakia. So so Nakia. Yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, you know, I haven't that's been to bed in four hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's seven in the morning there. Look, look no, I, and Nakia, Tara. Tara and Nakia, listen, I call, the problem is once you work with me, I start calling you for everything. So I, <laughs> both Tara and Nakia got a phone call where I was like, um, we're doing a low budget horror movie. Can you please come in and do this movie? <laughs> <laughs> a muzzle thumb, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you very, very much for joining us tonight and uh, for letting us show the film. I wish we could have seen it with a human audience together in a room reacting, because this will be such a wonderful audience film. But I do believe it's coming out in theaters in October? Yes. October 2nd. Is yeah. it October 2nd? Right October. on, for the good people at Magnolia, so it will get out there. Um, so yeah, to the audience, please tell your friends, enemies, everyone, that 12 Hour Shift is amazing, it exists, it'll be out in October, and they must, must, must prioritize seeing it. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Have a great night. Thank, you. Have a great thank you. Thank you. Thank you.